really, really honored to be uh, with not only a consummate professional, uh, somebody who's incredibly well respected internationally when it comes to national security, international security, but also a, a, a very, very long time friend. Uh, we've probably known each other for over 30 years, day, going back to our New Mexico days. So, uh, Dr. Wilson, it's always a pleasure to share the stage with you, and, and you, thank John. you for being here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wilson, uh, we're very, very fortunate to have here today. She uh, served uh, 10 years in Congress. Uh, before that, uh, she served on the National Security Council under the first uh, President Bush. Uh, she then uh, went on to, uh, while in Congress, served on three critical committees that are relevant to what we're going to be talking about today, House Intelligence, Armed Services, and you want to say the third one? Energy and Commerce. There you go, Energy and Commerce. So those are three powerful committees in Congress. And then, uh, most recently, before her uh, assignment as being president at UTEP, uh, was uh, the secretary of the Air Force. Uh, so I, what an amazing, what amazing career. So uh, we're, we're thrilled to have her here today. A um, little bit about uh, our organization very quickly, the Borderplex Alliance. We are... Uh, the only privately funded organization that I'm aware of that does economic development and policy advocacy for our region, otherwise defined as the borderplex. And that is uh, Ciudad Juarez, El Paso County, and my home county of Doniana County, New Mexico. So uh, we work very closely with uh, Dr. Wilson at UTEP, and uh, we're just really uh, happy to have that collaboration as well uh, over all these years. Let me start the questioning, uh, Dr. Wilson, with a kind of a general uh, inquiry about what your thoughts are right now about the status of uh, border security, mm. uh, maybe what keeps you up at night, and uh, start from a general uh, standpoint about what, what your thoughts are, given your background. Well, thank you. We can. I, I'd also like to talk a little bit about uh, the perspective, uh, my perspective at this point as a university president. U university of Texas at El Paso is in El Paso, Texas, located about a quarter of a mile from the U.S.-Mexico border. We have 24,000 students. Um, it's a class one research university, so it's the fourth most largest research university in the state of Texas. About 1,200 of our students cross the bridge every day from Mexico to go to school at UTEP. And in fact, students in Ciudad Juarez get in-state tuition at UTEP because they're within 100 miles of our university. And for all of Mexico, uh, University of Texas at El Paso has a program called the PASE program. So a family who in Mexico, anywhere in Mexico, who's, who earns less than about $50,000 a year, which is a lot of people in Mexico, they have in-state tuition at the University of Texas at El Paso. And it's a long time commitment that UTEP has made it's commitment to educating our region um, and opening opportunities for those who historically have been underserved by higher education. And as a result, um, there's a, you know, the, the U.S. Consul is here, and I think there's a roughly somewhere between 12 and 16,000 Mexican students studying somewhere in America every academic year. It's actually nowhere near as high as it probably should be. But of those, over 10, well, roughly 10%. Um, are studying at UTEP. So 10% of all of the Mexican students studying in the United States of America are at UTEP. It's a, remarkable, it's a remarkable story of a university seeking to serve the needs of the region um, uh, and, uh, and two countries. It's a remarkable record that UTEP has, and certainly you've been promoting this, I would say, uh, soft power maybe uh, the, across the border. Uh, because that is an important part of border security, is it not? It is, uh, but obviously it's not the most, you know, it's, it's not the part that most people think about when they think about safety and security in our region. And, and in the, the region that John and I live in, the El Paso Juarez region, is the fifth largest manufacturing region in all of North America. And it is a free trade region, uh, 4,600 trucks a day coming across that bridge, uh, one of the five bridges in El Paso. So, so our number one trading partner, Mexico, 20% of that trade comes through the city of Ciudad Juarez in El Paso. So it is, it's an important trading community and has been for 400 years. But most people outside of our region, when people talk to me about you know, what they see on the news, 
um, it's pictures of the border and the fence and the migration crisis that has been coming in waves over the last um, building, and certainly in the last week we've seen it even more, and record numbers over this last month. And so I think that's, I mean, that is a long-standing concern. Um, and I, I was reflecting on it because uh, Arturo Barrio, who works with me, mentioned this, and I actually went back and looked at it preparing for these remarks. I was in the Congress when Vicente Fox came to speak. And it was a, it was a remarkable event because very seldom does a foreign leader come, and it's not just that they speak to a joint session of Congress. The entire cabinet was there, as well as members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Because President Bush and Denny Hastert wanted to begin to make a difference and some changes in US-Mexico relations. And it was remarkable. Um, President Fox made a sincere appeal for changing the course of the relationship. And most of us don't remember it at all. Because it, it happened on a Thursday, so of course Congress was, we were all ready to get to the airport and go back home for the weekend, right? We came back the next week. Vicente Fox spoke to the assembled members of Congress on September 6, 2001. And the following Tuesday morning, the world changed. And that opportunity was lost as the agenda of the world changed to, to, to defeating the terrorist threat. And we've been frozen in time since that moment. With our laws haven't changed or been updated on immigration. And we're struggling with border security. We're struggling with an asylum system that doesn't work. And, as, and it's been a problem for both countries. The migration we're seeing now is not primarily from Mexico. It's from Venezuela and El Salvador and Haiti. And the migration through Mexico has attracted criminal elements. And so we have billion dollar industries with the cartels trafficking not just in drugs, but in people. This is a humanitarian problem. It's a security problem and it's an economic problem. And we need to drive bilateral cooperation to address it in a meaningful way. Dr. Wilson, you've spent a, de a decade in, uh, in Congress. Um, you've obviously seen what's been happening the last few days. Uh, what do you think will happen if you had to project in the future this issue of, of border security, migration issues. Do you have any optimism that, uh, that this might, might change? I know we have a few former members of Congress that are presenting uh, in other panels too, but what would be your opinion on the long-term or even short-term outlook for some sort of bipartisan uh, solution or, or, or help on this? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an optimist by nature, John. Um, but I believe that America is a nation of laws. We are also a nation of immigrants and that the American people are deeply decent and caring. Some of the most conservative ranchers I know in New Mexico put out bottles of water where they know people are crossing because they know people are coming up those arroyos and they're so thirsty. Um, we are deeply decent people, and I think that it is possible to build on that strong center to say we know our system isn't working. We know that our asylum laws need to be changed. Um, so that, you know, on average, someone who claims asylum now doesn't even get a hearing for four years. And in those four years, they can't work, they can't feed their families, and they don't know what's, what's going to happen to them. We need to change our asylum laws um, and speed up the asylum process. We also, I think, have a chance to build a broad coalition to change our immigration laws. You know, this has been building for a long time, and it was enhanced by the pandemic, but we have... Um, we have, a, um, we have a situation where there are jobs that are going unfilled, where people would like, to, would like to fill those jobs. And we have people who want to come to America to work. We should be able to enhance the security of the border. That means more people and technology, and yes, where appropriate barriers and systems. So it's highly likely that if someone crosses illegally, they will be detected and immediately sent back but that commerce can flow freely, 
and that there is a, a for those who want to come and work, there is an opportunity to do so legally. Um, our laws are not currently set up to do that. And unfortunately, there, there's a broad consensus in the middle on things like um, uh, expanding work permits, making immigration less based on chance, which it is now for a large number of people, and more based on talent. Uh, and uh, uh, we need to change those laws. And I'm, I'm actually hopeful that with a broad enough, we would be able to build a broad enough consensus and work in a cooperative way um, to make that happen. You touched upon earlier about the intersection of border security and economic development, job creation. Uh, maybe you could uh, uh, talk a little more about that. I'd actually like to, in a way, throw that back to you, John. I mean, how are all these national reports on the migrant crisis affecting your work? You're the one who's trying to get business to come to the border. Well, that's a great question. Uh, I think many of us in this room can empathize with the challenges that the national news media, at least in the United States, has been focused on the border. I see my colleagues from Laredo and other parts of the, of the border. It is an incredible challenge to us, and I'm going to be very, very candid. The good news for us right now is that we're record levels of vetted projects at the Borderplex Alliance. Uh, we've never seen numbers of companies like we're seeing now looking to expand or relocate uh, to our region. We are right now, uh, as I speak, hosting a couple of site visits back in El Paso for companies that are looking to reshore, nearshore, friendshore, all that. We've heard that those terms uh, quite a bit in this conference, and we all understand what that means. Um, but the bad news. We lost a very significant project in El Paso recently uh, to apparently a city more in the I-35 corridor, more in the interior of Texas. We had a site selection team that came to El Paso, recommended El Paso for this air cargo service as an auto supplier, would have provided well over 100 jobs, $100,000 a year salary plus. It would have been a fantastic project for us further bolstering our automotive supply chain in our region. The site selection team took the recommendation to senior members of the company, including the company's board of directors, who vetoed that recommendation, and that rarely happens. The reason given? The first migrant surge that happened earlier in the year was occurring, and the company's senior directors and management thought that El Paso was too chaotic uh, to place capital, create jobs, and settle in to our community. So it, was heartbreaking. it was heartbreaking for a lot of reasons, if I might just conclude in saying that, you know, El Paso right now, our region, uh, yes, it's the fifth largest manufacturing hub in North America. We are on the verge of closing in on the New York tri-state area for number four. We're only a few thousand jobs behind them. And at current projections continue, uh, the good news is, back to the good news, is that I think by the end of the year, we'll be the fourth largest manufacturing hub in terms of employment. Uh, and that's a, that's a significant accomplishment. But this perception of it being a violent, lawless frontier is false. It's a fallacy. El Paso, most recently, uh, came in, and according to our numbers and our, and our staff, the second safest city of a half a million and above in the United States. And yet we're perceived as a lawless, violent frontier. That's an incredibly frustrating thing for all of us that live in, in the border region, in, in at least our part. And I get asked about that too. When we, uh, you know, when, when the migrant surge happened in the winter, um, uh, you know, how is it affecting school? Well, it, it, it slowing things down on the bridges affects us more than the migrant surge does. And so, so um, it, is, uh, uh, it is not, um, it's not an issue in El Paso. El Paso is a very safe city, and I've lived in a lot of different cities and a lot of different countries. Um, I would also say Eric Cohen is here from the, from the consulate, and we are regularly briefed by the consulate on, on uh, the safety situation in Ciudad Juarez, and it's, you know, it's a little bit hard to compare statistics uh, for, for robbery and other kinds of things, but for homicide you can. 
And I, I, this is the way I explain it to you know, my friends and family. Ciudad Juarez is a little bit safer than New Orleans or St. Louis. So if you were, feel okay thinking about New Orleans or St. Louis as a place for your business to operate, um, you should be okay in Ciudad Juarez. And so, so it is a, it's a place where opportunity happens. And it's, it's rapidly growing. I, it's, uh, it's, there's not a week that goes by without another announcement of a business opening in El Paso. It's, uh, it's really an exciting time to be there. Yeah. It was an honor to see Ambassador Hills here. Uh, thank you for being here, Ambassador, and your participation and your service to our country and uh, promoting, uh, even now and today, uh, the continued bilateral relationship between the U.S. and Mexico and trade. Um, I have to tell you, Dr. Wilson, Ambassador, uh, I am a bit concerned about the national security and its potential impact in the, um, let's say, that uh, opponents to free trade, uh, uh, opponents to uh, this special relationship we have, especially with Mexico, taking advantage of the border security, uh, what they say is a crisis, and using it as leverage to harm the the uh, reexamination of the USMCA in 2026. Uh, that concerns me a great deal. Is this something that's on your mind as well, Dr. Wilson? Yeah, and I've always supported free trade, and I think, uh, uh, and I think we need to be concerned that um, that uh, that when when people look at at uh, the issue, if we don't address the issues related to to um, migration, it becomes a political problem, not just a humanitarian, security, or economic problem, and that can feed. Uh, kind of a populist reaction of uh, of um, uh, of uh, isolationism, including in trade, uh, that would be to the detriment of the American people. Um, free trade benefits America, and if we have anything close to a level playing field, American workers and productivity can export to the world. We need to understand uh, how how few consumers there are in the United States compared to the world as a whole and be, be very aggressive in, in opening up opportunities for free and fair trade all over the world. I would say that the best thing that companies can do to help in that regard is to talk to your workers and their families about how important that is. And I will just give you one story of frustration. I've always been a supporter of free trade, didn't have a huge amount of exports from my district, but it was as a matter of principle. I remember one company <coughs> was strongly supportive of my boats and asked me what I wanted. And I just said, tell your workers what this means for your company. And they said, well, you know, we don't really want to get involved in, you know, politics and advocacy and so on. And I said, golly, you know, you come here and you want me to tell my constituents why this matters, but you're not willing to stand up and do so. Um, you need to just explain why free trade matters. Uh, not, not just in a global sense, but directly for your workers in their lives. And I think, I think we can all, and, and it makes, and when it's really local, people understand. You know, uh, whether it's the cattle growers in New Mexico or someone who's trying to sell rock crushers into, into Chile, um, that, uh, that a, if they don't have a tariff, they can compete. And they can sell those rock crushers made in Las Lunas, New Mexico, into Chile. So. So I think, uh, I think advocacy is better when it's local. And let's face it, every one of you in this room is trusted more than any member of Congress. Before we go to questions from the audience, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, really go back to a point you made earlier about UTEP's role mm. in uh, promoting uh, the special bi-national relationship we have with Mexico and uh, how maybe that affects uh, national security or border security. That's one of this. I, I, so I love the University of Texas at El Paso is kind of one of one. You know, it's a unicorn. I absolutely love it. Um, but I, I think sometimes we underestimate, so does the media, the importance of things like art, sport, education, cultural events, and certainly business when it comes to the relationship between peoples. You focus a lot more on the government-to-government -government relationships, and the more important ones, the ones that happen every day um, across the borders, and they have huge long-term impact. 
I would say that education is one of those that is uh, probably one of the most important. If you think about it, one of the best things that America does as a whole in our relationships with other countries is educate tens of thousands of young people who come here from around the world to get a great education, and then they go back and they build their own countries. But they remain, they, they spend time with us at a really important, pivotal time of their lives. And likewise, when we send our children abroad for short or long-term experiences to see the world, it marks them and changes their perspective, so the relationships they have. And UTEP seeks to foster that. We received a very generous gift from the Hunt Family Foundation, a $25 million gift six months ago to make the Woody L. Hunt College of Business the best business school in the country for U.S.-Mexico trade. And we are building on that. Uh, we are working with the seven universities in our region, the University of Chihuahua and all of the Unitec de Monterrey and uh, UACJ in Ciudad Juarez uh, to, to do joint research on things like water, uh, sustainability, energy, materials. Um, and we're getting our students together. Now, this spring we'll have our first leadership conference. We're hosting it at, uh, at UTEP where we'll bring the student government leaders from all of those seven universities together to do three days of leadership training together. These young people are gonna be leaders in our region for the next 50 years. Let's help them to create those relationships now. And then it will pay dividends no matter whether they become a parish priest or a business leader or a city council member. So I think education has a lot to offer when it comes to relationships between peoples and not just relationships between governments. Very well put. Thank you. Uh, we have time for some questions from the audience. Uh, we're happy to entertain uh, any questions you all might have. I have them here chatted in on Whova, so we'll go ahead with the first one. As discussed, talent mobility is crucial for an integrated North America. You mentioned a lot has been done to ensure that people are awarded the legal documents to work based on talent rather than chance. <laughs> However, how do you account for potential? You know, I'm sorry, we kind of had a hard time hearing it. With I'm so the, sorry. Yes. As discussed, talent mobility is crucial for an integrated North America. You mentioned a lot has been done to ensure that people are awarded the legal documents to work based on talent rather than chance. However, how do you account for potential? I don't, you know, I think our immigration laws need to be changed so that it is less about uh, chance. We have a lottery system for a large number of visas. Um, uh, I don't think that's necessarily the right, right way to do it. I actually um, really like the idea it was uh, uh, included in some of the immigration bills. It was called, I think, um, the Staple Act. It was if you earned a degree in a high demand field from an American university, you get your green card stapled to your diploma from an American university. So to allow those who were educated in America, who wanted to stay in America, uh, to be able to work in America. I do also think that there are other ways to say, you know, for critical skills, for H-1B visas and so on, that, that we increase those numbers of H-1B visas. But, but here's the thing. I also believe that the fees for those visas should be significant from the companies who are bringing people in and that those fees should go into scholarships for American students to go to universities so they can get skills too. The resentment sometimes is that American taxpayers say, wait a minute, you're letting American companies bring in people from other countries, but what about my kids? You know, what, when are they gonna get a shot? And, and we need to recognize that politically and to say, that we are going to systematically open doors of opportunity to those who historically have been underserved. And that includes those who are the first in their families to go to college, who are coming from families who are low income, and let's keep the price, the out-of-pocket cost of post-high school educational affo education affordable to every family who wants a shot at the American dream. And that has to be the way it is. Next question. I hope you can hear me. If not, I will repeat it for you. What are the lessons the excellent El Paso Ciudad Juarez area can offer the rest of North America? Uh, 
there's a remarkable cooperativeness in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. And, so, and there, it's been there for 400 years. This has been a trading community for 400 years. It's the lowest, it's El Paso. It's the lowest pass between the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific no Ocean across the continent, continental divide. And it's on the river going north-south for trade in the Americas. So it is the passage. Um, so I think there is a deep level of willingness to cooperate and work out problems uh, in ways that are very pragmatic and that are not about um, uh, taking hard stances and being extremist on things. It is swarming a problem and solving it. And I saw this in spades during the pandemic where across the border, we were talking about one uh, earlier today where uh, it was a... Uh, uh, a Mexican businessman who found out that the food pantries in El Paso were short of fresh meat, and he's a cattle grower. And so it was, he, he shipped and donated produce, meat, from Mexico to El Paso to feed El Pasoans. You don't usually hear those stories, you know, who are about people who are hungry. And, and the, uh, the immunization program um, was... Uh, we were training people at UTEP from the universities and the public health system in Juarez to be able to m vaccinate people in the maquilas. Uh, and, uh, and at UTEP, we're not, a, we're not a hospital, but it was our nursing students, our pharmacy students supervised by their faculty who got licensed and, um, and vaccinated 30,000 people. I think one of the reasons that El Paso had one of the highest vaccination rates during the pandemic is because it was our students, it was the young people who had been translating for their parents and their grandparents for decades who were the ones who were getting it done. Uh, and it was a remarkable thing to see. If I might jump in very quickly, uh, I'm a native of the border region, very proudly multi-generational and uh, so proud. Uh, but I also have to, uh, compliment and, and certainly uh, give a shout out to uh, our colleagues in Desarrollo Económico de Ciudad Juárez, their sister organization that we work very well with. So the question was, what, what maybe could be learned about our region? Well, the Borderplex Alliance, as I mentioned before, works very closely with Desarrollo Económico. I, I see our Consul General Mauricio Ibarra here. Thank you, Mr. Consul General. The bottom line is this, uh, we all recognize in our region overwhelming majority of people in our region recognize that we are one integrated economy that shares a common history and a common future. That is in absolutely endemic with our, our thought process. It is absolutely what we believe. And it's somewhat unique. We don't look at what is as a different country necessarily. We don't why does not don't look at El Paso necessarily as a different country? We are indeed one big community. That provides a foundation for us moving forward with many of the topics that uh, Dr. Wilson was referring to. And we're extremely proud of, of our relationship with one another. The bottom line is this. On the U.S. side, we view Mexico as an economic and strategic ally of the United States. Absolutely critical uh, message as we move forward in talking about our future for a more prosperous North America. Our time, look at that, just right at zero, our time is up. So thank you all very, very much for uh, being with us. Dr. Wilson, thank you as always. Good, good to be with you again.